Okay, well let's start the medical advisory committee, the room review cases. Hopefully everybody's gotten, is this recording, Bill? Cool, Dale. Um, got some good cases. I think they'll be uh, educational. So, this is, the first one's from Santa Clara. Uh, the rest, the other four are from uh, NorCal. So, fire first responders, we have all ALS down in Santa Clara. The call type was pregnancy slash childbirth. PSAP time was 1338, en route, pretty quick, 1340. At the patient, again, not a very long uh, time, 1347. Primary impression, other OBGYN. Her chief complaint is that the patient doesn't feel the baby move. Uh, for the last 30 minutes. So what's what's starting to run through your mind? Okay. Okay? <laughs> okay. Um, you're thinking, well, is this a miscarriage? She's fairly far along, as we'll find out. So, miscarriage, present a previa, uh, any number of different things. Or that the baby just hasn't been that active for the last 30 minutes. No meds, allergies, uh, sorry, no allergies to meds. Uh, medications are iron. You'll see that the history changes a little bit between the fire first responder and the transport agency. So, no movement notice for the last 30 minutes of the patient. Uh, she's 20 week, 28 weaker. Uh, of note is that she's been pregnant four times with one live birth. So this should really start making you think this probably is more than just uh, okay, that's nice, have a nice day. Uh, you know, were, the, were these all miscarriages? Were they stillbirths? Um, this next bullet really should get you concerned is not only is the baby not moving but she's beginning to have blurred vision. So the family decided to call 911 for medical assistance. They found this 34 year old lying on the couch complaining of blurred vision and not being able to feel the baby move. So what's going through people's mind right now? It's past the okay stage. It's past the okay stage. It's, it's clearly viable. Yeah. Granted, it may be difficult, but 24 weeks is really the cutoff point. Some people say 23 now. Um, this I found in entertainment. Um, patient was Spanish speaking, and so they found a road worker on the street was used for translation. Uh, everybody should have access to a language line. Uh, last time I looked, a road worker is not the best translator, and it's just kind of pulling somebody off the street. Uh, Review is pretty good. No chest pain, shortness of breath, headache, nausea, vomiting, dizziness, abdominal pain, or, uh, no recent trauma or illnesses. Patient denies any vaginal discharge or bleeding. Now, if you have time, would you check to see if there's any bleeding? Or would you go by the history? I'd want to go by the history, but I'd probably want to also look mm -hmm. by visual. Yeah, I think you guys need to be doing visuals. Um, it's considered bad form to bring a person in uh, when the baby's crowning. Or when there's a lot of bleeding going on. That's probably something you really need to know. So they loaded her onto the gurney with uh, transport, that's EMS, County EMS is another name for Rural Metro, and no further incident or significant changes noticed. Doc? Yep. That was the first, if, if that was the first responder, hang on a second. Uh-huh. That was the first responder and EMS showed up right away, then maybe them not checking with them knowing that they're loading them on the gurney and putting them back in the ambulance. 
where the road worker is not readily available and all the rest of the world out there. That might not have been a bad It might not have. Uh, I, I think... I don't know if that's the case or not, but that's what was going through my mind. Yes, I need to look, but is it critical at this moment with all that stuff going on? I agree, Mr. Lane. At, at some point, somebody needs to check. Um, mental status, normal for the patient. Neuro is normal. Eyes reactive. Somebody's got, I got that echo problem again. If somebody could take it off speaker or it, it would be helpful. Just push the mute button if you can. Uh, chest and lungs, thank you whoever that was, it got away the echo. Normal chest assessment, clear, heart normal, abdomen normal, non-tender, extremities normal, GCS 15, all seems pretty good. Uh, vital signs, that should get your attention. Blood pressure, 185 over 100. Heart rate, 79. They never documented a respiratory rate, but our SATs were 99%. Monitor was said it was put on, but no interpretation. Blood glucose, normal. So what do people make of the vital signs? She's a lot hypertensive. Um, if you remember, blood pressure goes down in the second trimester. Uh, fairly significantly and doesn't start going back up until late in the third trimester to normal levels. So what condition are you thinking about with hypertension? Preeclampsia. Preeclampsia, exactly. Um, both paramedics did not even mention that, did not even address the high blood pressure. We'll see what happens later on. Uh, county ambulance got dispatched for a diabetic problem. Again, short ETA at the patient pretty quickly. They departed uh, not too long. So again, baby can't feel can't feel the baby move. They get a history that this woman's on insulin. Yeah. That would have been nice to know. She's had preeclampsia before, and she's been a gestational diabetic before. So this this woman's sick. Hypertensive, uh, gestational diabetic. Not to stick up for fire. They were there for four minutes before the ambulance was there, the patient. I understand. Um, so, again, they found her supine, 28 weeks. She's a, they documented G4P3, which is wrong. P3 means live birth, so somebody needs to get a little... Um, education. Uh, they again got her denying cramping, spotting, discharge, nausea, dizziness, vomiting, or abdominal pain. Um, vital signs performed on scene by fire. And then the patient was put in the gurney and moved to the back of the ambulance. So they did do a secondary PE in the ambulance. They did vital signs. A second one transported code to uh, upon arrival patient was sent to labor and delivery put on the bed report given their exam was normal mental status I would say you need a um, something that says that there's a language barrier Neuro normal, eyes reactive, lungs refined, belly soft, non tender, and extremities normal. So she's no longer a blood vision. Well, they, they actually don't mention blurred vision. But that's very intu intuitive, Tony, because you'll see when she gets to labor and delivery, she's complaining of blurred vision, has a hard time seeing. Again, blood pressure. Uh, anything diastolic above 160 or 160 and above is considered preeclamptic. So she had preeclampsia. Um, when they got a better interpreter, 
not only was she having a hard time seeing, period, her vision was blurry, blood pressure was up, um, she had a headache, and um, she was getting hyperreflexive. So, you need to really pay attention to your vital signs. Would they have done anything differently? No, but there was a delay in care uh, because they weren't prepared for somebody coming in who was preeclamptic because she easily could have started seizing. Uh, the last uh, eclamptic patient I took care of, by the time she got to the ED, she was cortically blind. She couldn't see anything because of uh, the preeclampsia. Interestingly enough, it's 10% of all pregnancies uh, are complicated by hypertension. This goes back to Hippocrates first discussed this back in the 5th century. Uh, it becomes eclampsia when they start seizing, become comatose. The thing that people need to realize and forget is upwards of a month to a month and a half, people can get preeclamptic after delivery. Uh, I'm not sure of the mechanism, but upwards of 20 weeks into the postpartum period, they can get hypertensive and seize. I don't think that's well appreciated. Uh, fetal effects, growth retardation, reduced amniotic fluid, never a good thing, abnormal fetal oxygenation, all bad things. Because the placenta really does not work well when uh, the patient's hypertensive. So risk, risk factors, no parity, having no prior pregnancies, family history of preeclampsia. The patient herself was preeclamptic, so that's a risk factor in the past. Uh, really poor outcomes in prior pregnancies, which she did have. She only had one live birth out of four pregnancies. Uh, Multi-fetal gestation, so if she's got twins or triplets or something like that, greater than 35 years of age. Now they say lower socioeconomic status, I think that really is because they don't necessarily have the ability to get as good a health care as they really need. So physical factors, obesity, chronic hypertension before they're pregnant, any renal disease, these are really kind of you'll never diagnose and never know about, but fancy molecular things like antiphospholipid antibody, protein C and S deficiencies that can cause also bleeding. Again, gestational diabetes, and if the patient's got lupus. So what happens? Well, the peripheral vascular resistance goes up, so the vessels are, are much more constricted. Uh, their left ventricular work goes up because of that. Hematologic, their, their plasma volume goes down, and it's really supposed to be going up in pregnancy. They have increased viscosity, so that preclude, um, not precludes, but um, <coughs> gives them a greater risk of having PE, particularly with hemoconcentration and bleeding disorders, renal disease. Uh, the GFR or glomerular filtration rate goes down so the kidneys don't work as well. Interesting, they can get hepatocellular or liver damage. They can get subcapsular hematomas. They get cerebral edema because the blood vessels in their brain just don't work as well. And they get endothelial dysfunction, which can cause platelets to adhere to the endothelial or the lining of the blood vessels and stroke. Never a good thing in pregnancy. Interestingly, um, patients who develop from preeclampsia into eclampsia, uh, if they have a seizure, that's 100% they're considered uh, eclamptic. Patients who complain of a headache who are hypertensive, 80% of those go on to become eclamptic. Visual disturbances, 40%. And if they have right upper quadrant pain, pain over their liver, um, with nausea, that's about a quarter, not a quarter, but a fifth. So what are you going to see before they seize? Headache, the hyperreflexia, visual disturbances, and the pain in the upper quadrant, right upper quadrant, or the epigastrium. So if you've got a pregnant person who's complaining of a headache, and they have a high blood pressure, and we'll define it in a minute, 
um, you ought to be real concerned. Uh, relation to seizure to delivery. Three quarters occur before, a quarter during, uh, before labor. Uh, during labor, about 50%, and about a quarter of these patients seize after delivery. That's a key take-home point. So anybody who's pregnant who has a uh, BP systolic greater than 160 or a diastolic greater than 110 is preeclamptic. They get tachycardia to kipnic, so they, they have an advanced respiratory rate. They can go into failure. Uh, mental status changes. Clonus, which is um, when you jerk their ankles up, they get at little beats of pushing against your hand. So what happens is this is your foot and this is your ankle, and you go like that, they'll get beats. And again, the pain in the right upper quadrant and the epigastrium. In the hospital, they're spilling protein because their kidneys don't work. They're always anemic. Their bilirubin's up because their liver's not working well. Uh, thrombocytopenia means their platelet count is very low, predisposes them to bleeding. They have increased liver function tests, and they have increased creatinine, which is a measure of kidney function. So what are you going to do in the field? you got to hydrate these patients, put them on the monitor, give them oxygen, because a lot of times they're... Um, if the fetus is in distress. Again, left lateral the cubitus position. There's some people who say it doesn't matter. I disagree. <sighs> yeah. Sorry to bother to pop in, but no. oxygen. If I remember correctly, and I'm only remembering what I saw, but they were talking about pulse oximetry 97 to 100 percent on room air. Mm -hmm. Are you still are you still saying that these Classic or pre-classic are going to need oxygen. Yes. And what and what volume are you talking about? And, not, and not, my assumption then is that we're doing it to not oxygenate the patient as much as to oxygenate the fetus. Correct. Correct. Um, two to four liters is fine. You know, it goes against what the American Heart says, but that's in chest pain or stroke patient where you're really looking at a SpO2 of 94%. Here, you want to try to almost hyper-oxygenate them. If they start seizing, I know in Santa Clara, we don't carry magnesium anymore. Um, you can use benzos. They don't work as well as magnesium. Just the way life is. Now, there are some protocols when I d got ready for this that actually talk about blood pressure control and in some parts of the country they use nitroglycerin. I have some angst and I'm really not sure and I'd have to find more studies. One of my concerns though is first time they're exposed to nitroglycerin, are they going to get a huge drop in blood pressure and become hypotensive? Not a good thing. If their brain is, u is used to a higher filling pressure and, the, and their autoregulation of their vessels is off and they suddenly lower their blood pressure say from 160 over 100 to 80 is that patient going to stroke or not quite possibly that's considered bad form so I'm not 100% convinced that nitroglycerin is a good thing so what causes the morbidity again the severe hypertension they can get permanent CNS issues they get disseminated intravascular coagulopathy. Fancy way of saying they use up all their clotting factors. Renal insufficiency to the kidneys, again, don't work. They can go into non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And they can cardiac arrest. Never a good thing. Any questions? OK. So case two, dispatch. And, and, and these, I, I really reproduce the narratives. I don't edit them. Dispatch from unconscious patient. Arrived to find fire ventilating a patient with BVM and O2. Okay. Patient's lying in bed. Respiratory distress. Almost arrest. Patient's daughter said he has a history of lung cancer. 
and is in the process of starting hospice. And so I'm wondering, where do we go with this? Patient does not have hospice initiated yet. The daughter again says, the doc is placing hospice and she does not know if this is the patient's wishes or choice. And the daughter's wishes are to have her dad resuscitated. I don't think it's fair to put the EMS providers in this situation. If this patient was in the ER, I would tell the daughter, this is not going to help your dad. The chances of your father living to leave the hospital are almost zilch. Uh, because somebody with advanced stage lung cancer, they have so many other metabolic issues. But the daughter says she wants resuscitation. Now, a physician can't put somebody on hospice unless it's the patient's wishes. They can't just say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm done with you, I'm putting you on hospice. It doesn't work that way. I just don't think in this particular case that the daughter came to grips that her father's terminally ill because uh, it should be IV, not IN. Ooh, intranasal chemo, that would be bad. Anyway, so a chemotherapy about three months ago didn't tolerate it and wish not to have any more treatment anymore. That makes me think hospice and DNR. The patient was then placed on PO treatment, which probably was steroids to help with uh, edema issues. So he's on an aspirin, he's on Coreg, which is a beta blocker. He's a diabetic because he's on LASIK, on Lantus, so he's probably on steroids. LASIK, so he has a history of CHF. Lipostat, so his cholesterol's high. He's got a fair amount of peripheral pain. That's why he's on Neurontin, which is a uh, anti-seizure med, but also helps with peripheral neuropathy. He's on niacin, Novolog, Silastatazole, Opremazole, which is um, a proton pump inhibitor for his uh, gastroesophageal reflux. He's on Ipotropium, which is for COPD asthma. He's on Zofran, Atropine, not quite sure, maybe for his secretions, Hydromorphone, and Lorazepam. You know, there is a mixed message being sent here. If this guy is not tolerating chemo and he's going to go on hospice, some of these meds are like, why bother? Like Lipostat. If he's got six months to live, who cares what his cholesterol is? Same thing for niacin. Who cares? Not going to help. So he's got a history of diabetes, high blood pressure, CHF, and lung cancer. So, he's ineffective respirations, pale, cool, dry, he's intubated, he'll never get off the vent if he lives that long. Sorry, hmm? He's a demitus. He's a demitus, bilateral breast sounds are fine, he's a CO2 retainer because he's at 58 or he's been down for a little bit, and he's, why are they always, you guys tell me, and when I've done runs, why are they always in the freaking back bedroom? Why? Because they are. <laughs> to, you know, just why? And it's usually a single wide. Okay. So, at 0148, no pulses. Monitor shows PEA, a rate of 80. They started CPR. They gave him epi. They gave him some more epi. And he was noticed to have a pulse at about 100. You give anybody enough epinephrine, you'll get them going for a little bit. Um, but he has no radial pulse. <coughs> that means he's got a really low blood pressure. Fluids are wide open, no effect on the blood pressure. Started a dopamine drip. Does get pulses back. I'm not disagreeing that 
they did what they did. I just feel bad for the poor man. It's, they gave report to the base hospital. Uh, a little while later, no palpable pulses. Not a surprise. Cardiac monitor revealed PEA. They turned off the dopamine. They started CPR. And they arrived with CPR in progress and report given. Um, actually, this is the physical exam. They did have uh, one episode of ROSC. Eyes reactive, mental status unresponsive. Extremities, he's really edematous. Low blood pressure. The reason why his heart rate's not higher is because of the Coreg, the beta blocker. SpO2 is 66. It'd be interesting to see normally what this guy's uh, SpO2. If he was a CO2 retainer, his normal SpO2 maybe was 78 to 84. Entile CO2 58, GCS 3, and they get a little better, but his SpO2 is still always very low at 61%. So they put him on 15 liters, gave him the epi, dopamine, gave him a third epi, and I looked at the EKG. It was, it was uh, interpreted as normal sinus rhythm with no ectopy. Well, when I looked really closely at it, he had a little ST segment elevation, V3 and V4. So, on top of everything else, he may have been having a big MI starting. Doesn't pretend well for the poor man. So, what do you think of the case? Hands tied. Hands tied. Got to do what you got to do. So it sucks to be the EMS crew with the daughter standing there saying do something you don't have any paperwork saying not to. That's exactly it. That's the bottom line. Was the care appropriate? Yes. What went well? I think they, they did the right thing by this patient. They put the tube. They gave the meds. What could have been approved? Yeah? Sorry to, sorry to be on the other side, but, you know, I teach paramedics too. This was a great case if you had a paramedic intern. Lots, lots of practice for not much hope. Um, no, I think that's an appropriate approach. The, this, this was a this was a no win situation from the, the very beginning, and I have a personal issue with working a patient this much with this kind of a problem. But I know they did what they're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. What could have been improved? Well, um, you know, at two o'clock in the morning trying to get a hold of their PMD to say, no, don't do this, they have a DNR, just ain't going to work. And until we have better legal and moral system in this country, I don't think there's any changes to protocols that are going to help with this situation. Okay. Case three. Dispatch to private uh, residence, code three, for chest pain in a 52-year-old female. Pretty standard stuff. On arrival, met by husband who escorted the patient. She's sitting in the living room on the sofa, mild distress. Patient stated that she's been having a, quote, pressure and burning sensation in her throat and upper chest. So what's, what's going through your mind? Think this is cardiac? We don't know yet, yeah, but they, potentially. Yeah, yeah I, I would start saying, hmm, pressure in the throat, chest, having this comfort for several hours that haven't gone away. She's had this sensation for a few months and treated with an unknown antacid, which resolved the issue. I don't know. I would be little, real leery of saying it's just heartburn. Well, that's that's one of the ones that will grab you right there. Right. Oh, that's what it is again. Yeah, that's the ones that will you'll end up in court saying, uh, well, I must... Um. So, patient's concerned because she's had, in March, a stent placed in her right coronary artery. Okay. So, in my mind, 
I'm thinking cardiac ischemia, cardiac disease. Denied any shortness of breath, nausea, vomiting. She did take a spray of her own nitroglycerin with no relief. There's a teaching point here that nowhere in the PCR did they check to see when her nitroglycerin was from or if it was had anything in it. <coughs> did she just get a spray of propellant? They didn't give her one of their own. I think that's a bad call. She denies any radiation. Now, when she had her stent play, she had shoulder pain. I wouldn't rest my, uh, my hat on that. She feels that she might be dehydrated following an airplane ride she had earlier in the day. Okay, so what, what are you thinking now besides cardiac? Exactly, Mr. Mastin. Does she have a PE? So, here's their exam. Alert and oriented. Skin, peak warm dry, head atraumatic, face symmetric, head normal. And, and for those of you who know me, WNL really means we never looked. I hate with the normal limits. I think that's a cop-out and sloppy. And I have never used WNL in dictation or documentation. Good that they put adequate tidal volume. Again, abdomen with the normal limits. Pelvis stable. I'm not sure what M-A-E-W means with, uh, that really should be a slash, with distal uh, capillary reflux sensation and motor intact. I don't know what M-A-E-W means. Does anybody have any clue? I think it's move all extremities. Move all extremities well. The distal, uh, distal thank you. I've been pondering that, and I really don't have, didn't have a clue. It's like Wheel of Fortune. It's, yeah, and that's exa exactly Mr. Mass. It's like Wheel of Fortune. Excuse me, I'd like to buy a vowel. Yeah. Um, I don't think that's an approved um, abbreviation. I could be wrong. And this is the chart they wrote. In, it's in a line by itself. There's actually a break between upper paragraph and lower paragraph. paragraph. Possible esophageal reflux. Who in the studio audience um, and in TV land think that putting down, and it was really clear all by itself, possible esophageal reflux is a good thing to put. Okay. Now, Am I overreacting or, I, I looked at this several times and went, rut row. That's poor documentation. Right. So, her vital signs. A little hypertensive, nothing to beat the band. Heart rate fine. Uh, again, respiratory rate 14. Second time, respiratory rate 14. Don't think so. But anyway. Um, negative stroke scale. EKG, really poor baseline. I had a real hard time reading it. The only thing I could get out of the EKG were some non-specific T-wave changes. Um, nothing that I get excited about. Uh, but a good percentage of patients who are having cardiac ischemia, their EKG is normal, uh, upwards of 20%. Vital signs, cardiac monitor applied, normal sinus, no ectopy. Patient stated she did not want transport or any further care. Okay. Um, this is what was written in the PCR. Patient was advised to seek further care from a physician or call EMS if needed. Well, okay. Patient signed refusal of care form and was left in her own care. Okay. Well, where's the rest? That was the entire against medical advice documentation. Now, there was a form signed whoop-de-doo. 
So, discussion. What do you guys think about this great case? Lots of teaching points. Who here yeah, thinks... Obviously, in document that they talk to the patient about uh, the risk uh, for refusal. That's correct. So, do you think the kid... Including that. Yep. Um, you know, she is having a big MI, and she goes in late. She's at risk. Anyway. She's at risk. She could have been a cardiac cripple if she lives. Um, you know, most people I've found, you tell them they'll die, they go, okay. You tell them that they'll live and they won't be able to wipe their own butt. That usually gets people's attention. Doc, the thing I saw on this that should have triggered them was she had a stint place fairly recently. And her only complaint prior to the stint was a left shoulder issue or something. So here is a typical 52-year-old non-traditional female cardiac issue going on with a past cardiac. You can't rule out an esophageal no. issue between that and a cardiac in the field. We don't can't give them a cardiac co cocktail with lidocaine and magne milk and magnesia or something like that, or do it anything else. Uh, Just the she, it looks really bad, and I can, I can tell you that I've reviewed charts, and from, uh, physician charts, for um, defendants, and I've seen stuff like, gets GI cocktail, pain relieved, send them home. You know, there are things in a GI cocktail that will relieve esophageal spasm or heartburn, the, you know, lidocaine is a wonderful drug because it relieves other things too. So do I think the care was appropriate? No. Should they have treated her as a cardiac patient? Yes. Should they have given her an aspirin? Yes. Um, for the platelet issues. And they should have tried their own nitro. This woman is a high-risk patient. So what do you think went well, other than them showing up? Good documentation. And eh, not so much. So what could have been improved? Follow-up. Follow-up? I think she could have been talked into going. Mm -hmm. I think the medic was convinced that this was esophageal reflux. And I wasn't there, I'll never know, but it sounds like the medic convinced her that this was just her uh, reflux and to take some antacids and call her doc. That's the way I read this PCR. Anybody see it any differently? Did they have a list, did we do a list of meds on that? No, the, there's no meds. Okay. No, I agree. I think uh, when the medic placed that in there in bold that uh, it was a reflex, I think that's where his train of thought was going also. Right. He may have been right, but you guys don't have the full battery of diagnostics to do in the field. This is a woman who I would have done serial EKGs on in the hospital. Uh, given her Lovenox, low, low molecular weight heparin, uh, done serial biomarkers like um, ultra-sensitive troponins which are getting more and more sensitive and er detecting ischemia earlier and earlier. You know, if there's any way for me to f figure out after the fact how this woman did, I'd love to. Because I, I just think this woman was done a disservice. Well, it sounds like the medic went in there with tunnel vision and picked up on the first thing he heard, and that was it. Oh, I, I completely agree, Bob. So, okay. Case number four. Uh, dispatched for anxiety in a 79-year-old. Fire had arrived already. 
put the woman on uh, 15 liters per minute, finding this young lady at 79, sitting in a chair, chief complaint of not feeling well and shortness of breath. That's never a good thing, not feeling well in an elderly person. That's uh, the Bermuda Triangle of uh, EMS and emergency medicine. Could be just about anything. So the son who's at the scene said that the chest pain started earlier in the day. It went away. She ate some cheesecake and it started not to feel well. Okay. Some cheesecake makes me feel that way too. Um, but she had chest pain earlier. She's also feeling shortness of breath. And many elderly who have very atypical presentations, particularly women, and will say, I just don't feel well. Now, interestingly, she's got a history of MRSA, methicillin resistant Staph aureus, and she's on antibiotics for that, more than likely Bactrim. Uh, she was having labor respirations and was not able to speak without exacerbating or shortness of breath, so I'm pretty concerned about this woman. Uh, at this point, most of the past medical history is from the son, but he's pretty distracted because his mom's not doing well, and so he's really not able to give a detailed past medical history. That's really good documentation. The only past medical history that was obtained was that she had CHF and as a home nurse that comes and see the patient. Again, good documentation. So the patient's conscious, alert. Patient's skin is pale, cool, diaphoretic. This really paints a picture, this next bullet. Severe labored breathing, respirations, only able to speak in one to three word sentences would exacerbate a shortness of breath if she spoke too much. Again, excellent documentation. Paints a really clear picture. She's using her accessory muscles of her throat, neck. Uh, her legs are bandaged, probably because she's got fairly s severe edema uh, and they're oozing. Patient denies chest pain, but I, at this point I don't care. Lung sounds diminished in all fields, so she's probably a COPD -er, or and or CHF. Lung sounds too diminished to hear rails or wheezes. So she got really poor air exchange. So I'm thinking COPD. And the rest of the AX are, um, I'm not sure that's an appropriate abbreviation, but as noted above. Again, the difficult house design. So they carried her out on a blanket. So fire must have stayed. Uh, transferred to the gurney, then life support. Treatment is noted. Patient pulse ox and respiratory uh, efficiency increased after CPAP was established. Great. Gave a radio report, patient in severe respiratory distress. Um, again, good documentation. They said, you're going to need RT, and she's going to need to be tubed. Great. I, I think I was really very pleased reading this. Uh, during p transport, patient's level of consciousness and respiratory effort decreased, uh, and a pulse ox started to plummet. So, I'm thinking, she's failing. You may need to bag or intubate her before she gets to the ED. Patient ineffective respirations on CPAP, again, paints a picture. They removed the CPAP, they ventilated her uh, by fire, so they took fire with them. Excellent. Patient's ventilation rate at 16 to keep pulse ox, 86 to 88 percent. This, I, I hate to say it, but I love, because they may not be able to get her pulse ox above 88 percent. That is just excellent. She has a gag. They don't think they can intubate her. They're assisting her ventilations. You know, I'm happy with a pulse ox of 88% on this woman. Again, they report the, uh, to the base hospital that they've got respiratory failure, and they arrive at the hospital with no further changes in the patient's condition. So, 
um, medications, clonazepam. She's got uh, pituitary or renal insufficiency, probably renal insufficiency with, uh, with the uh, hydrocortisone. Levothyroxine, so her thyroid doesn't work. Molderone is an anti-arrhythmic. Uh, uh, She's on potassium. Seratoline is actually Zoloft. I'd be depressed too if I had that type of history. Tramadol, painkiller, non-narcotic. Past medical history is CHF, cardiac arrhythmias, hence the uh, Mildredine. Yeah, look at that BP. Holy shit. She's in a hypertensive crisis, clearly. Respiratory rate of 40. SPO2 of 88. Those are not vital signs that you necessarily want to see. No, but they're also automatic BP cuff. And I, if I saw something like that on my, well, I don't have one, but if I had one and I saw that, then I'd have my EM2 get me a real one, a manual. I agree. Um, I'm assuming, too, that this, you're right, Tony, that this was a automated, I would get a manual one. Um, she's got a lot of endogenous epinephrine going. So, I think the care was appropriate. Um, the documentation was really good. They put her on CPAP, which was great. They noticed when she was failing and slowing up and desaturating more, and they started doing BVM. I don't see much that could have really been improved. I think this was a good case, good run. I don't see anything that would recommend changes to our protocols either. Okay. Now, this is actually an interesting case. Um, it's long. I, I admire the medic who wrote this. Um, it's a little bit of a novel, but it really goes into exquisite detail. Some of the stuff, a little extra verbiage, but, I, you know, they painted a good picture, good documentation. I'll give them that. So dispatch code 3 to address noted for man down. Fire is also there. Um, dispatch pre-arrival instructions. Um, but um, they're unable to move the patient to start CPR. Not a good thing. On arrival to the private residence, fires there, confined space again, large sides of the patient. They currently work in extricating him from the bathroom. This just doesn't sound like it's going to go well. Um, they're dragging him into the living room out of the confined bathroom hallway. 47 year old gentleman wearing 320 pounds. Uh, family heard a thud. Found him in the bathroom, face down, unable to move him. Good history. Family say that he was seen seven minutes prior to calling 911 and finding the patient down. So he's been down potentially for a bit. Once they extricated him and they could do treatment, they started CPR. Put in all airway, again, good. Ventilated with BVM high flow O2. Uh, rapid assessment, uh, patient has some pulses, is apneic, not a good thing. His pupils are fixed and dilated, again, not good. Um, patient states that he had a history of gastric bypass 12 years ago, arthritis. Here's the kicker, complaining of heartburn for two weeks. That wasn't heartburn. Denied any other recent illness or history. And um, I wrote that twice. I liked it so much. So they put the quick pads on, as well as a four lead, asystole. This is not going to go well. CPR initiated quickly afterward. Again, no IV access within a reasonable time. I just love that. They put the, an IO in. First attempt, great. You know, in most code situations, starting a peripheral IV probably is a waste of time. 
particularly with the onset of I.O. If you can get a quick IV, perfectly fine, but you shouldn't take more than two minutes to do that. Uh, start on wide open fluids, blood sugar on 193, uh, gave him epi, uh, put a king in immediately, I'm okay with that. Um, bilateral breath sounds equal chest rise, entile CO2 41, so they're going, doing good CPR. They did a rhythm check, asystole still, so they started CPR again. Second rhythm, and again, they rhythm checked them, V-fib, started the CPR where they charged the 200 and shocked. Um, you know, each time they said after confirming all personnel cleared of patient. They're just really documenting well. I have no issues with that. Um, they gave amiodarone, good. Uh, patient was still in V-fib, started CPR again, charged uh, the monitor to 360. Again, everybody's clear. Uh, CPR continued, epi given again, uh, placed on a hard backboard, again paints an excellent picture of the patients extricated, excuse me, but it took all personnel to lift them. Uh, patient to the LSU with no changes or without incident, patient continued with uh, equal breath sounds, proper king airway. Ventilations again without difficulty, good documentation. They did another rhythm check, again in V-fib, restarted CPR, shocked again in 360. Uh, they took two firefighters with them. This, you know, this type of resuscitation clearly is a team sport. Um, no kidding. So they gave him more epi, went into PEA, started CPR again. Now here's interesting, they, they called, gave report, and the doc said, give some bicarb. I, I really think that bicarb is a Hail Mary pass. I understand why the doc did it, down for a while, acidotic, I just don't think it's gonna help. And I would not be surprised in the next alliteration of ACLS um, that epinephrine is downplayed even more if not eliminated. There's more and more studies showing that you get people back with epi, they don't go home. We'll see what happens with the next, this, actually isn't it supposed to be out this year later? Yeah. Because the last one was... I'll tell you what, that bicarb order, they went, they probably looked at each other. Right and went, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because we went from giving four bicarbs, we started second IV to get bicarb, right? We do four, you'd slam them with four. It was an amazing thing, and then we quit completely, and now this guy's swallowed it in there. Mm -hmm. uh, rhythm check. Again, sinus tack with PVCs, carotid pulse was weak. That only lasted about 60 seconds. Um, and then no BP was able to be obtained. The patient back to PEA. Uh, they finally gave the bicarb. Rhythm check with sinus tack at 120. BP, they actually got a BP amazed. Then again, as t Tony has pointed out, it's an automatic BP cuff. I've seen automatic BP cuts take uh, blood pressures on gurney arms, you know, <laughs> the, the side rails. Just saying. Gave some more epi, more CPR. On arrival to the ED, you know, further patient contact. I, I would venture to guess that uh, this patient didn't go home. I'd venture to guess this patient didn't go to the ICU. So, exam for this patient. Unresponsive, pupils fixed, non-reactive. Uh, lung sounds, clear with BVM with ventilations. I think the, the exam's a little skimpy. 
Um, they documented everything else. I think they skimped a little on the physical exam. <coughs> Initial blood pressure. Entile CO2, good at 41. GCS, 3, blood sugar, elevated. And then they went through each um, time that they change rhythms from sinus tac to asystole to V-fib to V-fib again, PEA, sinus tac, PEA, sinus tac, and eventually just a PEA. Uh, Doc? Yeah. Do you think that maybe uh, whoever was documenting this was documenting in such excess because maybe they thought that they had gone overboard with this patient from the get-go? I don't know. Um, I've read other PCRs by this person, and they're pretty complete most of the times I've read their PCRs. Not quite to this level, um, but they're very thorough documenter. That's one of the nice things when I start reviewing PCRs and I start seeing multiple PCRs from different providers, and you can kind of get a feeling for them. Do, are they skimping? Are they always well documenting? And this person normally documents really well, not to this degree. So I'm not sure whether there were some sort of external forces, a hysterical family, and they were worried about that this was going to be a bad outcome. And or they were videotaped. Oh, now that's an interesting. Ooh, Mr. Maston. <coughs> you mean the family had their cell phone out yeah, and possibly. videotaping? Well, that's today's age. You're trying to do, you know, that, that might did, be why he's dumb. That never occurred to me. Awesome. Yeah, the family may have been videotaping the resuscitation. Yeah, somebody was videotaping me. I dot every I and cross every T. Huh. Excellent point. So CPR, adult assessment, BVM, CPR, again, it really very well delineated. So why DFib at 200 and then 360? Probably has to do with the biphasic or the... Um, that guy at 320, his imp it, it just with reads it the impedance if it's biphasic. You know, it used to be that stair step, 2, 2, 360, anyway. Yeah. But now with that, I'm thinking that guy, 300 and whatever the thing says, hey, hit him with this, because that's your, that's their only shot actually, that first hit. Right. You're, you're, you know, if you look at the CP, the uh, ischemic model, and early on, the electrical phase of cardiac arrest in VFib patients, yeah, you got to hit them, you, because otherwise you got to do CPR, and that really goes into a discussion about. A lot of people feel that even after you've buzzed them, defibrillated, let me use the proper term, you shouldn't even check for a pulse, that you should continue to do CPR for a while. Um, and yeah, because they're teaching now, you feel a pulse, you're still dealing with CPR for two more minutes. Right. So. Ooh, that's a good, I'm just thinking about that's a good take-home point. There have actually been several good take-home points from this case. <coughs> Oxygen, epi, ami. Interesting. I've got a kid um, down in Santa Clara. He's a four or five-year-old. Mom's a doc who had a cardiac arrest, went into V-fib, and it was shock-resistant and lido-resistant. He got into the ER. Um, and we're in the process of switching from Lido to amiodarone in Santa Clara, and Ami converted him and got his pulses back. Um, he went to a pediatric cardiologist, and he's got a really rare form of congenital uh, arrhythmia stuff, and Ami is what will work for him, not Lido and not shocking him. Huh. It was really pretty interesting. I've been t you know, talking and emailing the mom. So again, epi, epi, epi. That's a lot of epi on board there. <laughs> yeah. So, any questions, comments, concerns about uh, that, was a good one. that 
That was a good case. 